Welcome back to everyone that has been uh, in the morning session. Um, and welcome to all of you that uh, have joined just for the afternoon session. Um, today, uh, this afternoon, we're going to discuss safety of automated driving, as I said. Uh, it's a joint uh, workshop, as we have called it, between Euro NCAP, celebrating 20 years of Euro NCAP today, and the Okobi conference, which will start tomorrow at the Elsenveld here in Antwerp for the next three days. Uh, Okobi is, uh, of course, a, a long-running conference on safety, on biomechanics, uh, automotive and non-automotive. Uh, but, of course, the world is changing around us, and Okobi has to change with it. Uh, so, in the last couple of years, more and more uh, topics related to active safety and also automated driving have become part of the uh, Okobi uh, work. Uh, the workshop uh, will be... Uh, moderated by myself and Anders Lee, that you have heard uh, this morning and saw in, the, in some of the clips. Uh, but before that, I want to give the word to uh, Ola Ostrom from Autoliv to say a few words on behalf of ERCOBI. So, on behalf of uh, the ERCOBI Council, I welcome you all, especially all people that are attending the, the conference that is taking place in the rest of the week. Uh, I hope that after this uh, workshop, um, you have learned a lot uh, that you can be of benefit of to understand what, what is needed in biomechanic research the, the, the coming 20 years. All right. So what we have prepared for you this afternoon is actually uh, a couple of uh, uh, presentations, speeches by, I think, very renowned uh, experts in this field. Uh, we've tried to uh, have different aspects re represented in this afternoon's program. Uh, from policy making and consumer and the work that NCAP is doing uh, as part of the Roadmap 2025 uh, to uh, the development of sensors, vehicle interior. Uh, because the, prop, the, the, the subject of automated driving is so wide and so big, uh, we really have to make sure that we can cover at least some of the most important critical aspects when we talk about safety. So without further ado, I would suggest that uh, we go down uh, below and Anders comes up and introduces the first speaker. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here live, not only on the scene. We have a very exciting afternoon in front of us. We have nice presentations, and I will do my speech in between as short as possible. Our first presenter is Professor Andre Sieg from the German Highway Research Institute and he's going to talk about automated driving policies and consumer perspectives. He's a long-time friend and colleague and sometimes discussant from the UNCAP Board of Directors, and he has also been this, the president of UNCAP for a very important period. And now he's further on top of that also chairing the strategic working group on automated driving. So he's a very good person to talk about to automation, the challenges, policies, and consumer perspectives. Please, Andre. Yes, uh, Anders, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to be here and to be the first speaker for this workshop uh, about automated driving. And, um, uh, yes, uh, I have many slides and I try to compress it into 20 minutes, uh, so uh, I don't want to waste time. I am speaking here with two heads. First, uh, with the head uh, of BAST, uh, of the German Research Institute uh, for Highway Safety, and uh, secondly, uh, as uh, a member of Euro NCAP. Um, my um, speech is uh, structured into three areas. Uh, I have to start with some fundamental understanding about automated driving because uh, when we don't have a common understanding about that, we have a high chance not to understand each other. Therefore, I have to start with this, this of course. Then I will uh, show you some uh, legal requirements and legal challenges uh, we have to cope with when it's about automated driving, and uh, uh, yeah, the third part is, of course, Euro NCAP, the consumer perspective, and how Euro NCAP want to deal with uh, automated driving. So let's start. Uh, of course, I guess 
everyone here in the room know the SAE standard about um, vehicle automation, the six levels starting from zero up to uh, level five, uh, which explain the share between the driving tasks from driver only to machine only and some stages in between. Um, I not that sure, um, something happened with my red box here, I'm not that sure that you are aware that the standard was revised already one year ago in September 2016, and this was very important because there was a misunderstanding uh, in this um, uh, standard uh, about uh, level three. Level three, it was mentioned in the old standards, the driver is the fallback. And some people, and also some manufacturers understood this, that the driver is a fallback. That means immediately he has to step in when the system, the technology, the automated driving function has a problem. This was never the intention. It was always mentioned that this is with sufficient lead time. Yes, this is very important, and here uh, the SIE made a correction or make it more clear. Now they are talking about a, a so-called fallback-ready user or fallback-ready driver. Um, this is very important. This means the driver is, um, has to be ready, uh, and when he is not ready, the system has to deal with the issue. Um, The another thing is, um, when you look into the standard itself, you will see that uh, the basic idea is coming from BUST, by the way. Uh, five, six years ago, we uh, made research on this and uh, um, the SAE standard based on this. But SAE also referred to another thing, which is also important to understand. These are the operating principles. The operating principles is, in principle, an overlying structure before we're talking about the levels of automation. And here, We have, uh, on starting from the left side, uh, the, yeah, the tasks a driver has to do, these three layers, the navigation layer, when you start a ride, you have to decide how to come from A to B. The guidance layer, this is more a tactical layer, where you decide which lane do you want to uh, take, how to turn a curve, and then the stabilization layer, this is a, a concrete execution of a driving task in a, a, on, a, on a very uh, yeah, stabilization uh, um, situation. Everything we are talking today here is on the guidance layer. It is not on the navigation layer and it's not on the stabilization layer. This is important to understand. It's on the guidance layer. And the guidance layer is structured with these principles of uh, operation. Uh, the operation A, it's informing and warming, warning uh, uh, functions. B is continuously automating. And C is temporarily intervening in accident-prone situation. Uh, when I explain this as an engineer, I always say A is not a complete circle of a controller. A is just a sensor which detects the situation, a computer which think about that, but then the circle is not closed with an actor, the actor is a human being. The human being is warned against a hazard, and maybe it is an abstract hazard or a concrete hazard, Uh, maybe the human being is just informed about the status, and then the human being has to take an action. So A is not a con complete controller, it's just uh, part of a controller, and the human being is the rest of the controller, the human being has to take the action. B, operation uh, mode C, is uh, continuous automated. This is normal driving, and here we have our SRE levels, which explain what, what is the role uh, of the human driver and C, and this was also misunderstood by Nizza in the first uh, publication from them, C, here we have systems or functions which are just jumping in when it is very critical. For example, our very famous AB systems fit into operation mode C. Of course, an automated driving has to have an automation braking, an automated braking system, and also an automating steering system, even in accident-prone situations. But the primary controller could be also a human being. So 
and then uh, the uh, driver assistance system from operation mode C jumps in when the driver d doesn't react uh, appropriately uh, when an accident is, uh, is close. And um, here you see the full picture, as I already mentioned, and again here, unfortunately, my slides are a little bit uh, destroyed. Um, here you see um, the red is operation mode B, as I mentioned, the SRE standards. And uh, for the blue part here, the operation mode C, we already proposed also a, a better or, or a more uh, um, uh, structured uh, proposal uh, how to uh, structure all these uh, functions uh, which are temporarily intervening in accident-prone situations. Just important to understand what we are talking about, and this was very theoretically. We use it already in UranCap, and here you see exactly that UranCap also has these category A, B, and C, and I just want to give you an, uh, one example here when we are looking for lane supporting systems. Lane supporting system can based on different functions. Lane departure warning function, of course, a warning function, it's clear, it must be A. Um, I want to draw your attention on uh, the last two functions under lateral support systems which is uh, a lane keeping function and uh, emergency lane keeping function. And we had a long discussion with industry because Eurancap want to have a lane keeping assist function always on. And industry said, no, 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 uh, a lane keeping assist um, maybe is not perfect on a very narrow road with narrow curves. Uh, so it must be possible to switch it off. And then we realized with this structure in mind that we are talking about two different functions. Industry was talking about a lane keeping function which take an action in an abstract hazard, category C, abstract hazard, um, when there is a concrete hazard, category C, concrete hazard, this is an emergency lane keep assist, and this should be always on. So, uh, this is exactly, uh, or this structure helped us to understand each other that we as Eurancap want to have this emergency lane keep assist always on. That means when there is a risk that the car one off the road hit a tree or run into an uh, oncoming traffic, this must be always on. But of course, a lane keeping function which just make sure that you stay within the lanes or within the, within the road marks. This is something different and this could be switched off. So you see why we need these very theoretically uh, uh, understanding of automated driving in order to take the right action and to understand each other. A little bit about uh, legal requirements. Um, and uh, here uh, I see three um, areas uh, where uh, we have to take action or where we have challenges regarding um, uh, the traffic law. And the first one is the traffic law itself or the Road Traffic Act. Um, the Road Traffic Act in Germany was uh, uh, modified this summer by the parliament. Uh, why did we uh, did this? Um, the reason is um, we believe that um, uh, an automated driving a self-acting machine in public area on the public road is such a fundamental change that this cannot be taken by the government itself. We need a uh, parliament decision on that. We need a parliament law, a road traffic law on this, that really the parliament is aware that we change from a car which is driven by a human being and where the human being is responsible to a machine which is acting. And this is uh, quite fundamental and I believe, of course, this is a national thing and I believe every country has to cope with this and this is not on a European level, this is in Europe and also in other uh, um, regions of the world a national thing. You have to think how to allow from a very fundamental point of view, how to allow that a machine, a self-acting machine, can do actions on a, in a public area, on a public road. We argue from our constitution, by the way, because the government is responsible to uh, keep uh, hazards away from the society, and we um, decide uh, that due to our constitution, it is needed that the parliament decide about that. And just one sentence here, because 
many countries look to the German law and uh, try to translate it into English, and uh, there very often is one mistake in the tra uh, translation. Um, we um, have the situation that, you know, in level three, we are talking about uh, um, the driver, who is the uh, fallback ready driver, fallback ready user, and this means, um, yeah, again, a sufficient lead time, and it is not an immediate lead takeover, as I mentioned. And this is reflected in this Road Traffic Act as well. And uh, here we are talking about undue delay, which is very often uh, um, uh, used, uh, uh, or where the translator very often used immediately. Immediately is wrong here. It is the legal term undue delay, which means or which reflect these sufficient lead time for a human being to step in back when he is a fallback ready user. And again, this is a national thing and every country has to think about how to uh, modify your uh, road traffic law. The second thing is uh, about liability and insurance. In Germany, we have the lucky situation that our vehicle uh, insurance based on two pillars, on the driver pillar. Driver means um, this uh, is uh, the driver is insured when he or she makes a mistake. So a fault-based liability. But we have also a second pillar, which is the vehicle keeper uh, insurance. Uh, and this is just because of the operational hazard of a vehicle in the traffic, independent if there is a fault or not. And this is a lucky thing that uh, with this uh, second pillar, we can allow immediately uh, automated cars uh, on German roads um, uh, because they are already insured by our system. But this, again, can be different in different countries. And in Europe, uh, we have big differences. Uh, and uh, again, this is a question how to cope with this. And the third one is, uh, of course, the technical thing, the type approval, and here we are on an international uh, level, uh, which is uh, the UN Regulation 79, you know, that uh, the ACSF uh, group try to modify or create criteria for an uh, automatically commanded steering function, which is more or less an automated driving. Okay, last Four minutes, consumer perspective. Um, as you have seen in our roadmap, EuroNCAP uh, wants to deal with this question of automated driving. And the first question is, uh, uh, in which way? So it is, again, EuroNCAP will focus on continuously automated driving. This is this category B, we already learned. Um, so it is a normal driving. It is not accident-prone situation because all the functions from accident-prone situations, the category C functions, are already in our standard safety assessment. Now we are looking for normal driving. And due to the fact that automated driving is seen separately by the consumer and we don't want to compromise our very well-established five-star current rating system for safety in a car, we decide to have a separate rating or at the first stage grading uh, for automated driving systems. Um, question is how uh, can automated driving contribute to road safety and I see uh, two sources how automated uh, driving can contribute to road safety. It is uh, the uh, avoidance of critical situation. When the car is driving in the, in the given use case, the car will always uh, stick to the rules. Uh, the car will not speeding, the car will not be aggressive, the car will not be distracted. So the absence of critical situation is one main contributor to uh, road safety, but at the beginning, the use cases are quite small, that the car can be self-driving in a parking area will not create many benefit for the society. But we cannot imagine, and this is the second source, we cannot imagine an automated or self-driving car without all these emergency functions from C. And this is the main contributor at the beginning, in the first years, um, because these 
category C functions can be also always on when a human driver is driving without or in an area which is not covered by the use case of the automated driving function. Therefore, again, um, this is the main focus for us, um, category C functions in automated uh, cars. Yes, um, what is the objective? Uh, as always, and as in, in our five-star rating, it's the same. Uh, the objective is on one side uh, to establish good, high standard criteria for con uh, continuously automated driving functions. And on the second, it is uh, the information of the consumer, an independent information of the consumer. Uh, what is what the consumer can expect from a car, and what is his role in a car which is automated, which called whatever, uh, autopilot, and what is his role in a car which calls this uh, automated function autopilot. And uh, yes, we have to transfer a very complex situation, as you have seen at the beginning of my presentation, into a very simple message to the consumer. And we decide already that we will use these four steps, these four, uh, yeah, I don't want to say levels, we say grading scales. It is continuously assisted, basic automated, advanced automated, and superior automated. And the expert already realized that continuously assisted is level two and uh, the basic advanced and superior automated is level three or higher. Um, as I said, we start um, the assessment uh, with the use cases. So we look into the handbook and uh, look how the use case is described, and we decide we start from level two up onwards. That means level two, three, four, or five systems. And of course, we look for the use case, and we look how the use case is described. And then maybe this is one use case, a second use case. So we can imagine many, many different use cases, a highway, driving, a pilot, a traffic jam uh, assist, a parking uh, uh, assist. By the way, traffic jam assist, a traffic jam pilot, this will be soon available on German Autobahn. As you have seen, our traffic law has changed. It is allowed to turn away from the driving task uh, under the new uh, German uh, traffic regime, traffic law regime, and uh, Audi with the A8 will um, bring a um, traffic jam pilot soon onto the market. So this will be the first time that ordinary people, normal people can use it. The assessment is grouped into two things, system performance, the technical performance, and on the second hand, the uh, HMI, the human uh, uh, factors assessment uh, with the mental model, uh, with the mode awareness of the driver. So we will uh, explore new areas of assessment with the uh, methods from uh, the psychologists. And we have two uh, subgroups, uh, human factor subgroup and the testing subgroup, and industry is invited, and I don't want to show the picture now, the film now. Last sentence, uh, Euro NCAP, yeah, sorry, you have to blame Anders. No, you have to blame me, I'm a little bit too long. Uh, last uh, slide is, um, uh, we uh, will do a phase-in approach, that means we start with level two, which is available at the moment already, and uh, we hope to be able to communicate within the year 2018 with the first assessment of automated driving functions, and we will continue this uh, for the next years and maybe for a long time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Andre. Uh, this already gives you a, a bit of an idea of what uh, te technology innovation means for regulators and also for consumer organizations like ourselves. It's quite a challenge to, to deal with these systems because actually all the definitions that we used to know have to be redefined, re-reviewed. Uh, re, re, re um, the next speaker I'm really pleased to, uh, to announce, we go from Germany to North America, to the United States. I think one of the areas in the world where, uh, where automated vehicle technology and, and also the policy making is perhaps most advanced. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Brian Reimer, he is uh, a research scientist at the MIT H Lab and the associate director of the New England University Transportation Center at MIT. His research, and that's a mouthful, seeks to develop theoretical and applied insight into the driver behavior by fusing together traditional physiological methods with big data analy analytics 
in computer vision, deep learning, and predictive modeling. So he founded and leads three academic uh, industry partnerships, including the AVT Consortium, which stands for Advanced Vehicle Technology, uh, focused on developing understanding of driver use of emerging vehicle technologies, including production level automated driving systems. So it's, yeah, I think the ultimate perfect person to talk to us about uh, advanced uh, technology. Please. <laughs> So I come to you from the smaller of the two schools in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the one where technology is in the name, now what's your question? And I come to tell you that perhaps technology evolution is not going to solve the future of driving in the ways that many would like to predict. 90 plus percent of accidents relate to human behavior. And as long as we as humans are a core component of vehicle transport and have a role in the system, whether that is a supervisor or active driver, we have a responsibility to consider how the human may relate to this complex social technical system. Well, the context of vehicle automation is discussed on a daily basis as being new. Well, we have five or six levels of vehicle automation. The context of automation, however, has been going on for decades in the automotive ecosystem. Perhaps for me, the tipping point in vehicle automation in the car has nothing to do with Tesla's autopilot system, Audi's A8 that comes to market soon, or even Google's self-driving car. The tipping point is the introduction of the automatic transmission. So moving my hand from shifting, I'm an American driver, so it's the right hand, from shifting to an automatic transmission, automation, reduced my responsibilities what do humans in the U.S., drivers in the U.S. do? They picked up the phone. The relationship between automation, reducing workload, and human behavior is what? We find something else to do. So, class participation here is 95%. If we reduce the human's responsibility through automation, what's the human going to do? Find something that we don't fully understand yet to do. Even uh, us technological folks believe we know the answers, humans will find another reason, or as we were talking about, Apple will invent something new for us to find to do that we haven't even envisioned yet. So when we think about advanced technologies in the car, I have the pleasure of leading an organization that's supported by Delphi, Liberty Mutual, JLR, AutoLeave, Toyota, Giro, and Consumer Reports, and I welcome many of the rest of you in the organization to get involved here, to begin to look beyond the technology to look at how technology interacts with humans and the environment in real-world situations to under, begin to understand how people are using, leveraging, or not using technology in the wild. So while we as engineers love to build technology in the lab, build specifications, think about how do we engineer to the best possible specification we can define, when we get into the chaotic, wild, real world, people do impractical things. We experience edge cases, situations that no one would expect. They're not practical. By all means, that's because we're only human. So our focus here is to collect data, to begin to characterize an understanding, particularly in the L2 area, how people are using automation in the wild. Now, this slide was formed on the last data set poll we had, where we had about 150,000 miles of data on disk. And right now, I'll tell you, it's somewhere closer to a quarter million miles on disk. Or about 200,000 miles of that data is watching drivers in Tesla vehicles with autopilot. And everybody would say, well, it's the video. It's the amount of miles that are of interest. Lots of folks in here will tell you it's not the miles. It's the frames and the pixels of information that begin to characterize the information content in the new world currency video. So when we begin to think about these technologies and we begin to educate some of the consumers we're working with around technologies, one thing becomes very salient. Even in an educated or trained user, terminology around technology is fatally flawed. So if you train somebody and you teach them about Adaptive cruise control. Yes, the bulk of your population remembers the word adaptive cruise control, but you're filtering cruise control, Ford 
uh, control maintenance, lots of other funny words. So when we think about the terminology of technology, we need to think about education. Someone earlier on this morning mentioned the dealership and the delivery of technology at the dealership. And I could go on for a half an hour on how problematic that is in the U.S. If we want to move advanced technology to the consumer, we have to train the consumer and teach them how to use it. The myth about automation is, with automation and technology, we can rely on less human expertise. It's a myth. We need to educate more. So when we look at technology in the wild, everybody sits here and thinks, well, Tesla is leading the way by doing automatic updates from the cloud. Well, you know what? Volvo did a dealer deliver update in the US this spring, where they significantly improved the performance characteristics here measured as the percentage time available of the pilot assist system substantially. But when you went to the dealer and you took your car to the dealer and they installed this upgrade, they handed you a little pamphlet and they told you about the upgrades to the HMI for the navigation system. They didn't tell you that, number one, they turned off the lane departure warnings and they're relying solely on the haptic systems, or two, they altered the performance characteristics of their quote-unquote cutting-edge automation system. So a user, if someone was to use the system and had the experience, gets into the car, starts driving it with it again, and the system's fundamentally behaving differently. So from a responsibility and ethical perspective, if we are going to change technology, and I hope we do set a trend moving forward of improving technology over time, post-production, we need to be clear and transparent to the consumer in that. And we already begin to see cases today from Tesla, where you get a nice little readme, to Volvo providing perhaps incomplete information at the dealer. When we look at Tesla's autopilot system, what becomes very painfully obvious in a very positive way is over 30% of the miles and 10% of the time that drivers in our study are involved, and this is over 20 individuals, over 200,000 miles, about 30% of the miles are being traveled under autopilot. In essence, drivers are using this system to a large degree in highway fast travel conditions. What other driving assistance technology is there out there that is being used in the U.S. marketplace for 30% of the miles traveled? Now, what's interesting when you begin to look at those miles, and you can look at the plot on the right here, the blue GPS points are where the autopilot system is engaged, overlaid over the red GPS points where manual control is interacting. You see that, look, it's highway travel. That's great. Okay? That means people are by and large self-selecting the geofence themselves, which is good. Okay, why isn't there a geofence involved here? That's a whole other question, a strong geofence. But what we do see among the 16,000 transitions of control in this system, over 450 hours of use, that we begin to see that humans are by and large turning the system on for very short periods of time, in occasion. In other cases, an extremely long tail where usage in the half hour, hour range is not uncommon. So drivers turn the system on, and we'll call that human-to-machine transition, and drivers turn this off, machine-to-human, human-initiated transitions, where the human decided that for some reason I don't feel comfortable with this system, I want to get off an exit or for any other reason that we may think of to turn the technology off. Then there's a third class here, the class being the system initiating the transition. Out of 450 hours of driving, there's 42 of them. 42 situations where the vehicle said, here, driver, it's your problem. And that sounds like a lot until you dive into the numbers a little bit. 12 of those cases are the driver exceeding the ODD speed boundary of 90 miles per hour. Is that carelessness? The system was only designed to work up to 90 miles an hour. Another subset, following a car through an intersection, hands on the wheel, trial and error, experiential learning, how far can I push this system? We never really taught them how to use it. So when we look at autopilot, for all of its flaws, it's perhaps one of the most successful, if not the most successful, human-robotic interaction that has been created to date. Humans are interacting with, for some unforeseen way, quite successfully with a highly complex robotic system. And perhaps by luck, that is based upon the fact that it is flawed just enough 
that the human does not overtrust it in most situations, but good enough that we're willing to rely on it to some degree. The interesting questions will become, over time, as we understand safety over billions of miles, does it advance safety, as Elon Musk would like to proclaim, or does it become more of a safety nuance over time? And that is something we'll all figure out together. So one of the big interesting questions that when you begin to look at naturalistic data is that the relationship between our theoretical understanding of automation and what actually happens in the real world gets very mushy. For instance, let's ask the question, when has the driver successfully accepted the transition of control? When have they regained full awareness of the operating scene? Further, drivers demonstrate a variety of different use styles. So the concept of a lot of the theory we've been developing in the laboratory and building simulations around needs to be validated to real-world use cases to understand which aspects of the theory carry over and which aspects don't. We can also begin to use the data that we have to train end-to-end -end deep neural networks for perception and control. That means relying on the pixels of information to develop steering control. In this illustration here, the black wheel being Tesla's proprietary control system, the green wheel being our end-to-end -end network laid on top of that. What we can do is look at the divergence function in the bottom right, and using that divergent function, we can train a classifier to predict with 90% accuracy in a six-second window the likelihood of a human to decide to regain control from the autopilot system. In essence, something salient is occurring in the scene and the world ahead of us that the classifiers are detecting. We can also use a different form of deep neural networks, deep reinforcement-based learning, to develop a perceptual control system where the robot here, in the form of an RC car, begins to learn from experience how to avoid high-speed crashes. So being trained by experience of crashing, how to learn not to crash. So for those of us in the world of automobile crashes, if we had the video from 250 million crashes, can we use AI and the advances of AI to teach a robot how to avoid unpredictable crashes as we see them today? And from a theoretical perspective, at this point, the answer appears yes. Thinking further, another flavor of my work. Developing an integrated model of driver attention. As I mentioned at the start of this talk, as we automate, we reduce driver workload. I was given a great clean slate a number of years ago, and currently working with Denzo, Honda, JLR, Panasonic, and Google, to really move and develop a new philosophy on how we think about HMI design. To say, is the perspective on driver distraction that has been center point to the automotive industry and the regulatory frameworks for a number of years, the right perspective? Or do we need to begin thinking differently under the context of attention management on how to deal with high levels of demand, fatigue, and attention all together in a ubiquitous framework as a whole with the growing trend of risk on the road from distraction, manual driving, and automation? Context, how do we help the driver in real time make better decisions? To give you a quick flavor, how we begin to do this, we begin to think about the context of driver state estimation. Topics such as body position, gaze region estimation, emotion detection, cognitive load estimation, hand placement, and perhaps even the most important to some of us, smartphone detection in the vehicle. We can use computer vision, deep learning, and other vision perspectives to understand what's happening in the cab of the car in ways that are not trivial, but are quite practical today. The illustration on the right is an image processing pipeline for cognitive load detection, where we can pull levels of cognitive load out of naturalistic data in three levels and accuracy over 86%. And in real-world data, that is a number that is, by golly, um, approaching the ceiling. We can begin to think about the perspective of distraction quite differently from attention management. Distraction says, hey, I got a crash. What happened before that crash? Hey, the dummy was looking at the phone. Great, what can I do about that? Absolutely nothing. 
But from an attention management perspective, what is going, drivers doing upstream that led to the downstream consequences of looking at that phone? And is precisely what is happening upstream that perhaps is leading to that inopportune glance at the wrong time. So from an attention management perspective, we want to say, how do we manage the flow of information over time? The criticality being acquiring information by looking at the road. For those of you who do HMI assessment, demand assessment, everybody's been trying to minimize the off-road glance time. Well, what do we want to do at the same time? Maximize the threading of glance time at the road. And that has been, for better or for worse, because of some policy and funding decisions over the last 15, 20 years, ignored. And it's precisely in the relationship between on-road glance time and off-road glance time that lets us build curves like these. The hybrid measure of attention that we've developed allows us to see divergences in the attentional profile of crashes from near crashes in the 100-car naturalistic data set in the US, approximately 50 15 seconds prior to the precipitating event. That's way out there. What can you do with 10 or 15 seconds of information? I see Michael saying, hmm, I can do a lot with that. Better yet, it validates in the Sharp 2 data set, which means it wasn't a one-of-a-kind finding. And when you take aspects of the Sharp 2 data set apart, perhaps in the illustration on the right, texting, and you normalize to the phone interaction. You say 0% to 100%. The curve on the right shows us that the individuals who ended up in a crash started texting with depleted awareness to the outside world. That means it's not about the texting task in itself. It's about the inopportune time that they decided to text. So we've been worried for decades about how do we ensure designing better HMI minimizing the distraction of an interface. And I don't want to say we want to forget about that. Perhaps the bigger overarching question is, how do we help drivers choreograph the information flow on the, over time and make better decisions when they begin to integrate and do things in real time? That means adaptive HMI and adaptive automation all brought together under one umbrella. So some closing thoughts. The future may be autonomous, but humans will have a role for some time. Level two systems introduce a number of use challenges that are incredibly interesting to study and explore, and, and many of us are doing that now, and we will continue to do so for decades to come. Reported experiences with L2 and L1 technologies combined with qualitative data tell us a story, and I wish I had time to talk about the story in depth, but the story is run of mode confusion, role confusion, and system confusion being the taxonomy. Role confusion, or mode confusion, what mode is operating now? Role confusion, what's my responsibility? And system confusion, what system's trying to help me? What do we have on the roads today? An utterly confused, uneducated driver. But we're creating higher levels of technology to go along with it. So investment in human-centered engineering throughout the automotive ecosystem is really critical to safe mobility. If we don't include the human in this decision process, whether we're developing L1, L2, L3, or L4 vehicles as a centerpiece, we're not going to solve the problem we want. That means improved communication with the driver, fused decision models that consider driver state, and consumer education, whether that's dealer delivery or in pseudo. Only if we can get the policy, the technology, and the human factors to overlap can we really solve the automated driving questions that we look to achieve. Solving any one of these buckets alone will not make the safety changes we need. They have to work together. So for those companies out there that say, we're going to create the technology that's going to change the world, it's only going to change the world if the human and the policy goes along with that. So in terms of NCAT, looking forward for the next 20 years, NCAT's going to need to consider some things that are quite different than the past. One, technology enhancements post-production. How do you revalidate a safety system or a crash system when a car was updated six months after it was released? How do we deal with active learning systems? Systems that are learning minute by minute. Tesla's got a great example. Autopilot is learning day by day and, and updating the decision models. Is that good or bad? Hopefully good. Automation that changes how we view harm. 
the whole context of harm, fatalities, injuries, property damage, safety, environmental impacts mentioned earlier. We need to rethink about that. Is it some zero or is it some derivative of some zero? Can consideration of safety from various perspectives and benefit estimation? I believe in societal considerations. If you can cut the number of fatalities in half, that is an achievement to my perspective. But from the engineering side, the manufacturers will look at that from a safety liability trade-off and the user at the end of the day, did you protect me? It's all about me. So, a few in the audience are from the biomechanical world. New cars will maintain their form factor for some time. But changes will appear that could justify the elimination of the steering wheel, the throttle, the brake, some of today's passive safety systems, and perhaps even at some point, traditionally manually controlled vehicles in some contexts. However, I will tell you, you have a lot of interesting work to do because the same automation technologies are going to drastically change how cars collide how we need to protect occupants in the future. This is not going to be a transformation to zero overnight. Only if the industry works together with the policy and the quasi-governmental regulation organizations and academia together will we actually be able to achieve the vision zero that we all strive to. The complexities of automation are immense and they have enormous potential. And it's going to be a fun road for the next 20 years of Euro NCAP and the rest of the safety community. Thank you all for hosting me. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. Thank you. Thank you very much. It, it's a very inspiring cultural journey we're doing. We see different cultures and different approaches. And we will now continue that journey to Japan when Tetsuya Ijima, who is the general manager of automated cars and driving at Nissan Motor Company, will present on the theme, uh, bringing autonomous drive to market, technological challenges and solutions. Please. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting us to this stage. Today, uh, I will talk about uh, Nissan's uh, recent approach, how we introduced uh, real autonomous driving technology uh, onto the market as fast as possible and as realistic as possible. First, uh, <clears throat> I'm talking about the, our milestones, how we introduced our technologies. 2016, Highway single lane technology. This is the first step. And second step, 2018, highway multi lane technology. And 2020, including urban roads and intersections. And uh, mid 2020s, uh, free autonomous drive and driverless technology. Uh, we think step by step introduction of this technology is uh, critically important uh, to let uh, drivers and society to have a better understanding and better acceptance of the technology. This figure shows what kind of uh, aspect is the most critical at this moment. We, be we believe uh, expansion of the uh, available situations is the most important as of today. And Innovation in environmental perception is a key to realize this part. So the enabling technology is our sensors or HD map or B2X communications. Next, we are talking about others. AD technology is our, uh, comes from the past asset of the others. In Nissan case, uh, we are uh, aggressively working on this technology in the past 18 to 19 years, and we have uh, many industry-first technologies. For example, uh, for longitudinal technologies, uh, in addition to AB, uh, we have uh, what we call distance control assist. Uh, this is a, a combined technology of uh, autom automated braking and force feedback pedal uh, that works 
uh, always uh, without the ACC uh, activation. And for backward, uh, we have a factory call, backup collision intervention. Uh, this is the old uh, made it braking function to avoid the collision with the cross traffic and the uh, uh, rear crossing pedestrians. And uh, for lateral part, uh, we introduced rain departure prevention and blind spot intervention uh, for our name. Uh, this is the uh, combination of the radar sensing technology and uh, braking control technology. And uh, for surrounding uh, view enhancement, uh, we have a around view monitor with moving object detection. Uh, this is uh, uh, not only a vision information, but also the integration of the machine vision and the uh, surround view uh, display technology. And uh, in addition of uh, other technology, we need to add the advancement in other technologies, like Reliability. Reliability, in this case, are uh, uh, in a very general meaning uh, from the customer concept of view, point of view. And redundancy of the system. And HMI for safety. These are the main area uh, we need to stress, uh, we need to focus uh, to introduce AD technologies. From here, uh, I want to explain about the, some of the important part of the uh, three technologies. First, reliability. Uh, this is the very general concept of the customer. So how far the system is available in adverse environment or uh, how far the system is capable to react to the critical situations. Adverse environment, uh, rain, snow, fog, sandstorm, these are uh, very uh, easy uh, cases. And critical situations, most typical case is a sudden movement of the, of the adjacent vehicle. Uh, this is maybe the, one of the most critical situations drive need to react uh, in emergency. And uh, it's a rare case, but for example, the vehicle jumps onto your vehicle uh, over uh, center divider, uh, this is the actual accident that happened uh, uh, in May in Japan. And land slide, uh, this is also the sudden uh, situation. So to enhance the capability to re react to these situations, uh, technology enabler is a sensor system, algorithm, and uh, vehicle response. The next, uh, I'm talking about the redundancy. Uh, redundancy is the, uh, required to secure safety in failure. And this, there are three, five areas uh, of technology. The first, sensing. More than two sensors should detect one object. And for control, a uh, control algorithm should be located in backup issue. And for actuation, uh, two ways of actuation uh, need to be equipped uh, to maintain steering and braking function in case. And for communication, uh, dual communication bus is uh, secured. And power supply, uh, dual power supply network need to be secured. These are the design requirement for redundancy. But uh, uh, in future, uh, we need to have a more strict uh, requirement for this area. And next, HMI for safety. Or this means uh, uh, before complete replacement of the human driver uh, is attained, driver need to, be, need to provide a proper, proper involvement in the driving. So uh, system must be designed to secure proper involvement of the driver. And it's mostly warning. And so if the system thinks driver's involvement necessary, our system need to uh, issue a warning uh, using a display, sound, or a haptic with an intuitive way. But in addition, uh, if driver is not available, the vehicle need to stop safely. These are the uh, requirement for HMI uh, for safety. 
So we understand the how to design uh, important essential part of the uh, autonomous drive designs. And the next step, uh, if we want to accelerate the development of the technology, we need to understand the real traffic environment. Traffic environment are uh, mostly categorized in two areas, road structure and traffic. And if we see the different technology for highway use or city road, or the road structure and traffic is uh, very different. For example, for highway, uh, comparatively uh, simple structure. However, in, in city road, uh, intersection or runabout is uh, very complicated. And for traffic on freeway, uh, only motor vehicles and the situations are mostly predictable. However, on city roads, uh, vulnerable road users exist and situations are very unpredictable. And in addition, uh, <coughs> road structure and traffic safety is uh, different in different geographic uh, regions. So, we are uh, aggressively accelerating the test on public road. Uh, we have already uh, conducted an uh, intensive uh, evaluation of this technology uh, in Silicon Valley, London, and Tokyo in the past two years. The vehicle we used uh, in each region, uh, this is a sensor set for the vehicle. So five radars, 12 cameras, and five radars are installed to detect the uh, various traffic situations, uh, like a right turn or traffic circle or uh, angled intersection. And this vehicle also have a specially designed HMI. And the <coughs> several display mode is uh, provided, uh, provides intuitive understanding of the system status in different environment. For example, uh, speed independent view. At low speed, uh, the system screenshot the forward object. But, uh, uh, according to the uh, rate of the speed, uh, the eye point gradually go higher and the display show the uh, more wide area of the bigger. This is uh, consistent uh, with the driver's interest uh, in each situation. And in addition, uh, we have a, a city driving view. So driver is concerned if the vehicle is uh, correctly understand the situations. So we will show the runabout view because of the <coughs> traffic and road environment are, are very complex in this area. And for in residential area, uh, we will provide a specially designed fine view uh, because the uh, some area is a uh, restricted to drive, and some areas uh, pedestrian crossing exists, and uh, <coughs> parked vehicle also appears. And uh, in the right screen uh, of this picture, showed the uh, some special rules in England. Uh, in England, uh, if the pedestrian is uh, waiting under this yellow ball, uh, vehicle must stop. This is a very strict rule. So <coughs> that's, this uh, screen showed the, uh, the system understand the strict rule correctly, and you need to read down the system. And next. So uh, based on our uh, past evaluation, uh, in three regions, we identified uh, various situations uh, that need to be investigated more in detail for road intersections, various intersections, runabout, rain reduction, traffic signal, local rule, zebra zone, because should not stop in there, and the uh, freeway exit, merging tunnels, and traffic, pedestrians, bicycles, parked vehicle, crossing vehicle, stop vehicle, cutting in short distance. These situations are uh, precisely analyzed and reflected to the next version of the software. Now, I can show you some of the uh, footage uh, of our test driving. This is a Tokyo downtown area and driving in a typical downtown seas. 
this is a bridge uh, on Tokyo Bay, and uh, we are doing the auto lane change uh, in here. It's a, under the tunnel, a GPS signal is not available, and uh, this is a merging in dense city traffic. And this is a typical uh, downtown driving area, uh, including uh, intersection driving. And then this is the uh, Silicon Valley uh, test. Uh, we are now driving 101 on freeway and uh, also driving on the city traffic, uh, including uh, intersection and signals. And this is a very uh, critical merging on freeway. And then this is the left turn, uh, seeing, identifying the arrow or signal, or, and need to drive where no lane divider is provided. And this is the London uh, test, uh, close to London City Airport, uh, east side of the London. And driving uh, traffic circle, and the rain divider is a special shape and signalized uh, traffic circle. And the screen shows the uh, road structure of the traffic circle. And now we are driving uh, onto the uh, residential area uh, where there is a uh, restricted area in the center of the road. Or parked vehicle or uh, pedestrians or crossing information. And uh, actually, uh, in here, uh, pedestrian is walking <laughs> on the roadside. So precise location need to be uh, shown uh, on the display uh, to make a good trust between the driver and the vehicle. So this is the uh, typical uh, driving scenario uh, we challenged. Uh, in the last uh, London demonstration. <coughs> and <coughs> then we uh, look up back upon the milestones of our uh, technology. Now we are in 2016, uh, 17, and last year uh, we introduced a uh, highway single lane technology from a Japanese market. We already introduced uh, three models, uh, Serena, uh, this is a Japanese dedicated model, and uh, X-Trail, and uh, Leaf, this is a new Leaf, uh, just uh, last week. And we already conducted uh, some customer uh, acceptance, and 97% of the customer use the system on freeway because uh, it is very easy to use and reliable. And 69% of the customer have a positive driving impression. Uh, this is a very uh, encouraging for us uh, to expand this technology to mass market. And then uh, for the next stage, we are focusing on the development of our uh, highway multi-lane technology and urban road intersection technology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ijima. Yes. Thank you. I think a very clear example how mainstream manufacturers, volume manufacturers, are ready to deploy this technology onto our roads. Uh, we move on, to, move on to the next speaker, which probably doesn't need much introduction as he was on stage already, Wella Bostrom from Autoleaf. You know, everybody knows Autoleaf as a history, uh, a company with a very long history on passive safety, recently also into active safety, and I think from last year on was propelled into the area of uh, automated driving with a cooperation, uh, Zenuity with Volvo. Uh, you're going to talk about a bit of everything, I think, from the passive safety perspective as well as from a sensor and communication perspective. So the floor is yours. Thank you very Thanks much, Ola. Michel. So um, the title here is On the Road to Saving Lives. That's what I'm going to talk about. And 
with sort of passive and active restraints, with ADAS and AD, and AI and, and uh, user experience. So I would like to start um, talking about levels of trust, shifting from discussing uh, levels of automation. So I start with confidence and trust, two, two various aspects of trust, where basically confidence is built in experience and, and trust is not. I will like, come back to that. And when I talk about trust or confidence, bear in mind, I'm not referring to when you over-trust or under. You see the examples there, well, if you, if you trust the car for some reason, you can, you can text while driving. That's, that's an over-trusting. And if you switch off safety-critical systems, that's also uh, under-trusting. We believe that we need to, to build trust in order to save lives. And I will come back to reasons for that later. But what I mean with this is to um, have a consistent exp user experience. And I think, as we heard this morning and, and, and this afternoon, I, I believe that this is something that your NCAP can do a lot of th a thing about to make the, the uh, experience consistent. It's also managing the mobility and to introduce and use sort of the, the new uh, breakthroughs in deep learning and machine learning. Uh, in, in our company, we put a lot of uh, emphasis on that right now, and we have to bring this in. Now we'll come back to that. What we build trust from is what we do already in everyday traffic. So this is sort of the quality, the robustness, and innovation. That's sort of the, the what we do as as the platform. What we do today, where we produce airbags and belts and radars and cameras all over the world, every day. They should work in every every every. every Every day. So it's, it's about bringing this together, and I will talk about that. Another view on, on the roadmap to save lives could be this. You, you take your hands off, your feet off, your hands off, and eventually the mind off. I don't believe, we don't believe that this is sort of the, the true roadmap to save lives to get rid of the driver. And I will sort of steer away from that and still talk about automated driving. On the other hand, we have a lot of data coming in, into, in, in our new cars. There are a lot of sensors out there. We get a lot of information, but we don't use it. There's not much of this data being used. And as we heard Brian was talking about for the driver, the drivers get less and less experienced getting supported from the car. And you can hear stories about that. People going from a car with a blind spot detection, not understanding really that blind spot helping them to, to avoid a crash. And then they go to a car without blind spots. And then all of a sudden they realize something is missing there and they always crash, almost crash. You hear these stories. So, to put it simple, we need a human-centric approach. And that was what, what Brian was talking about here as well. We need the human and the machine as a joint cognitive system. What I mean with that is, if I sit in the car and look straight ahead, the car can look reward as a joint cognitive system. We can have a shared control, a transparent, clear way how to share the control in the car. Some tasks I'm still doing as, as the driver, some task is done by the car. And to accomplish this, we need the car and the driver to trust each other, both ways. Otherwise, it's going to be switched off or, or uh, 
uh, it will not help. And then that's the reason why you have the user experience and the deep learning there to the right. We need to bring that in. At least as for us and as a supplier in, in this business, we need to really uh, get that competence and, and supply in this area. Hi, Katie. So that was the Learning Intelligent Vehicle. We launched it in January this year, a research vehicle to show what we meant with the human-centric approach, with shared control, bringing AI and, and user experience together. So we had a live vehicle you could drive on a parking lot in Vegas and experience what we meant. And we got a lot of good feedback from that. And we are continuing working on, on the Live 2.0 for, for next CS and using it as, as, as a research, research vehicle. So let me talk about the road towards what we believe would really save more lives. So you see two axes here. One is the real life safety. That's where we've been sort of we feel safe within our company to, to produce quality, quality and, and, and robust products. And as I've been talking now about, it's not enough. You need to consider the user experience, getting the trust in there. And here I put up four stages, and I will, I will talk about them. The, the, the cool stage, the confident, the intelligent, and then the trusted. Uh, level and the live car is sort of showing at least the in intelligence stage So What I mean here with cool stage is sort of the willingness to buy it's about reacting and responding. It's basically the fr basic ADAS And we will gain understanding by by the usage of, of, of these of products in this stage and people want to buy it. Again, blind spot. People do want to have blind spot in their next car if they tried it. This is something we can see in research. The next stage is the confident. It's about plan and monitor. Less warnings, more pleasure. People switch off less times. And we, we can call it advanced ADAS. And I will come back to, we're going to do some safety benefit calculations out of this. So, so far, this goes almost on itself. Now we come to the sort of a more trickier, and we come to the intelligent part, where we talk about behave and learn, and the car is as good as an alert driver. The car is good, as good as an alert driver. And the user will regard the car as intelligent, and that is the, 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 the theme here. And the last one, trusted. It's about anticipate and model. So the car can handle completely new conditions. That's basically level four and five, right? The user can fully trust the car to drive and still drive it. Now, in the bottom line here, should be on the top maybe, is that for all these stages, there's airbags in the cars, belts, and they are used. And that is extremely important for the benefit calculations I will now show. So in all these stages, think of bags and belts according to all new seating positions and new loading conditions. So let's calculate what, what that this means in terms of saved lives. Okay? What matters here? So the method we're using is, is um, uh, used before, for example, by Johan Strandroth. Um, so basically, we take three in-depth databases. One from India, RASI, one from Germany, GDAS, and then NAS. Okay? We start there. And then we put up some, some bundles here. So we put up the, we, we, the airbags and the belts, the uh, standard ADAS, for example, in the first stage. 
And then we apply rule sets per this technology. So we use risk curves, we use sort of uh, uh, to what speeds you can anticipate the, the, this function work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And then we calculate the residual. So what's left from today traffic, from India, Germany, and US. And then we extrapolate to future levels. And that is basically then the way we can calculate the benefit. Taking from these three countries, which sort of represent from low to middle to high income countries. So, you're the first one to see this publicly. This, this, is going, this, this work will be published the year to come in more than one paper. So you will have time to read the details, and we can sort of redo these calculations in, in many ways. But to start with, and we start with 1.4 million fatalities per year. That's the starting point, 2015. And if we do nothing, do nothing meaning we don't do any research, we don't have these type of workshops, and we just live with what we have with people in China not using the seat belts, airbags not in, in, in all cars, and the standard, standard ADS, ADAS only sort of survives in, in a small fleet. We go up to, I would say, 2.4 million, 2045. On the other hand, if we bundle together the cool stage and the confident stage to, to, one, to one stage. We call it confident. Today's, so imagine until from now to 2045, 2045 in, in these cars, you have today's safety technology. Consumers apparently want to buy this and confidence in the vehicle's perception. Then we will see this. So basically, you will sort of stabilize the situation. We will have one point, slightly more than 1.4 million, 2045. Again, according to these calculations. If we take the other two, the, the last two stages, the intelligent and the trust, and we call it trust, we see quite, quite a good uh, life saved calculation here. So imagine 2045, all cars having some sort of a cool pilot, shared control, the driver considers the, the vehicle intelligent, and there's a full trust in the vehicle. Basically, the numbers will go down to, to uh, close to zero. So how as a supplier, how, how do we tackle this? So we're using this pyramid. It's very hard to see what it says, but in the, on the bottom here, you have the LIDARs and the radars and so forth, and then comes the, the blind spot monitoring, and then you go up and you get um, uh, the, the lane keeping, and then you go up, you have the AEB, and then the more you come up here, you, you, you come closer to autonomous drive. And we really started from the base here. That's sort of where we come from with, with quality and robustness and, and provide these this, this, uh, sensors. And then we formed the company Senuity this year together with an OEM. So the Senuity is sort of taking part of the up, upper part of the pyramid and, and focus a lot of deep learning. Now, we have joint forces with the OEM, but there's no exclusivity at all involved. So we are we can provide software to any OEM. It doesn't have anything to do with, with our joint ownership of, of this company. Okay, sorry. I, I, I just introduced this movie first. So, imagine now in a movie, and again, this is the first time publicly it's shown, okay? So you're the first viewers. Imagine sort of a future of automated driving and how we combine active and passive safety. So, enjoy.
So don't consider this as sort of the solution. It's not about that. It's just to show you that if a OEM says you can recline the seat and you can trust the car, you can sleep, then you may need a belt system. The belt was integrated in the seat here. You need an airbag system that provides you with, with support in this crash. You, you're not helped by a curtain up in the, in the roof. You need it closer to, to you. So regard what you just saw as how we see sort of how we need to comply with new load conditions, new seating uh, conditions. So my concluding slide here is one word here that comes into my mind at least for what I've been talking about, and that's collaboration. Collaboration between the driver and the car, not elimination of the driver, which is sometimes sort of discussed, but a collaboration. And when I bring this up, it's not just development I'm talking about or, or producing. It's putting research money to understand how do you collaborate within a machine and a human, not necessarily in automotive and to understand from other research fields as well. The other collaboration theme is between active and passive safety. Clearly, as I showed now in, in this video. And at last, collaboration across organizations, between suppliers, OEMs, universities, ANCAPs, and so forth. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ola, giving a Swedish touch to presentations and uh, there are some very interesting findings, I think. We continue the program. We are now at Eris Dagan from Mobileye, who will present provably safe and scalable AV architecture. Please welcome to the scene. So good afternoon. Uh, thanks a lot for having me uh, talk on this event. Uh, I want to uh, oh, here we are. I want to correspond just shortly before we start with the talks that were given so far. I think the triangle is very important to visualize the policymakers, the human, and the technology. And uh, I, th I see that the, re the previous talks gave very firm and very valid points about the uh, human and technology interaction. I would like to focus on how we improve the policy technology interaction such that we can maybe even assist that other link of human and technology. I think that the policy should always represent the, uh, the best interest of the public and of that human, so maybe that's another way of building such trust. Um, so, uh, maybe just to be... Uh, I'll, I'll start with one very simple, very, uh, very uh, true and, and naive and, and banal statement that autonomous driving carries a promise of huge public safety and societal efficiency benefits. And these are two different things. Public safety is one thing, and that's the, uh, the motivation of this organization. Uh, uh, societal efficiency is another word for economy, of like a dirty money word that we're talking about, but it's the, the, the immense economical benefits in autonomous driving are, you, we cannot ignore them. Um, what you see here, screen, and we'll see that video again later, is an autonomous driving demonstration uh, in the last CES in Vegas. Uh, the important point, and here is less, the less, uh, the less uh, straightforward statement to make, is that sustainable AD solutions must be provably safe. It's not just safe you need to be able to explain why, this, why they're safe. And that's, I think, where most technology suppliers are now standing. It's not, the, uh, not making the technology safe, it's being able to demonstrate its, sa demonstrate its safety, predict its safety, both to the uh, policy makers as well as to the humans that are gonna use it. And that's a big, big, pro big hurdle. Uh, and the... Uh, other thing is, if we want to, to uh, collect the other fruit of societal efficiency benefits, 
uh, we cannot violate uh, the economic scalability of these solutions. We need to have them economically scalable, not deal with brute force uh, technological solutions if we want to uh, also benefit from the other economical uh, aspect of it. So the rest, the, the, the few upcoming slides, I'm going to rush maybe through some of them because they lay the technical foundation for what we want to say. But if I want to, uh, if I want to be, uh, give some, some sort of uh, motivation for these slides, it's that misdirected approaches to the problem may risk widespread adoption of uh, AV into the future. If autonomous driving will, cause, will increase the level of fatality before it decreases it, it will be shelved for many years. And we have to conduct responsibly in this introduction phase. And uh, a lack of formal uh, model-based safety assurances may lead to rely on intractable empirical safety validation techniques. That's a long sentence. Uh, another way of saying is that if you don't have a formal model of why your car is safe or a formal model that, that structures your approach to the safety of the vehicle, uh, out of the box or uh, treating it as a black box and only empirically validating it is not a very good strategy to do. It's not a tractable one. Uh, the second part is that, uh, uh, again, uh, ungraceful scaling in terms of economies of the solutions uh, could also be a hurdle to, what, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, widespread adoptions of these solutions. So, uh, again, uh, the, the next few slides are going to be a bit textual, laying the, laying the foundations, and, the, and then we get back to the uh, fun uh, video uh, just to see the technology that implements it, okay? But bear with me, please. I'll, I'll try to make it a bit short. Um, we're going to show a pragmatic and applicable formal safety model and share mobilize uh, autonomous vehicle design principles and the formal safety and scalability aspects these principles adhere to. So this is basically our work in this, and this is our map for the entire talk. So uh, we'll, this, this, understanding this map will allow me to run through the, the more boring sections of it. Um, let's look at sensing and driving policy. Policy here is not in the sense of public policy, it's in the sense of driving policy, decision-making of the vehicle. So we have two technological layers, sensing of the environment around us and making decisions in light of our perception of that environment. That's sensing and policy. The uh, other, uh, the vertical columns stand for challenges in terms of safety and scalability of these, of these, uh, these layers of the solution. Um, as mentioned, for the uh, driving policy safety, we present an RSS model. The innovative approach of that model is that it clearly and formally captures the concept of blame, okay? I think that in any uh, engagement of humans uh, running into an accident, that's a key aspect, a key question to answer. Uh, the important and the re responsible statement to make is that we cannot guarantee 100% safety. We can guarantee 100% safety up to blame, up to the responsibility of that autonomous vehicle. Uh, and we can easily visualize a situation where a vehicle is driving in between a few cars, unable to change its position, unable to take any, any uh, uh, evasive maneuver, and one of the other vehicles simply runs into it. And we really need to, to very out loud spell this, this blame or responsibility very, very formally so we can, uh, so we can then guarantee safety. Um, the, uh, moving downwards, uh, we need to understand the uh, implications of sensing systems and decouple the implications of these sensing system errors on safety critical elements versus drive comfort. These are very, very deep, deeply different aspects of autonomous driving. And uh, this, this distinction uh, allows to also uh, move us into more scalable and pragmatic AV solutions as we go forward. But we use the RSS model of the, of the decision-making to formally uh, infer 
a clear uh, distinction between sensing errors that cause safety problems and sensing errors that cause, cause mere comfort problems. And this is a very important distinction to make. Um, Let's move for the other ones, I think that the, the block on the right, uh, lower right side, uh, is, uh, that's where all the fun videos are. We'll see it, it's all of the technology and what we propose as a scalable solution to the problem. And on the, uh, on the policy side, we also propose a scalable decision-making uh, solution. Something that, is, that does not, let's talk about it just for a second. The technological challenge of decision-making in a very dynamic environment is uh, if you take that uh, computational problem with a brute force, brute force approach, which means that you're trying to span all possible uh, future situations in order to make a decision about your current decision, you're facing what's called a computa computationally explosive problem. You need servers on your car to deal with this kind of uh, what if, what else, everything. And that's, that's not the approach. We, we offer something scalable to address this, uh, this challenge. So I'll run through this. I, I, I warned you. Um, this is a, just the structure of how we structure the concept of blame bottom up. In this case, it's top down. But we start from the definitions of corridor, what is a cut-in event, what is safe longitudinal distance, we can, uh, what is exposure time if we want to generalize to the case of occlusions. And we reach a definition of what is, uh, what is a situation of your blame. What is that uh, case? We then use that, and this is not to be read. <laughs> we then use that, the, uh, we, we compose a uh, very specific emergency maneuver, DEP. And we have a very strong proof that says uh, that if you, uh, if you are uh, applying a very, very temporally local, and this is something, uh, if you apply a very, very uh, temporary local check of your decision-making process, only checking something that takes into account very, very concurrent uh, situation elements, you can guarantee the safety up to, uh, the into the future. And that relies on our definition of blame and definition of that emergency policy. But this is, again, uh, there is a very, very deep paper published on the, on, the, on the topic. I really encourage you to look into that. And we're looking uh, into uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, very good opportunities that we have to converse with the regulators, be that of uh, private entities like uh, Cup or governmental ones, uh, to, to really, uh, to really uh, instill this, this vocabulary and, and, and come up with, uh, with a common discussion language for, for the safety of, of a vehicle, uh, safety of decision-making vehicle. Um, um, moving an, onwards, this is an important uh, statement that uh, the right measure to judge how well a sensing system uh, approximates reality, it's by the impact on the decision-making. You don't need to judge how well it measures the distance to the vehicle if that's not a critical measurement for the vehicle. And we then, as I said, disambiguate, and I don't go into these details, disambiguate what are these sensing errors that may cause safety critical decision or misdecision, and what are uh, these errors in the sensing that cause only drive comfort compromises. And we disambiguate them again based on that formal definition that we talked about. Um, I'll move on to this one. As I mentioned earlier, the problem of, of decision-making is computationally explosive. You need to span all of the uh, possible happenings forward and all of the possible responses of agents around you. Uh, and there are several approaches how to m moderate that problem. All of these currently are not uh, tractable or not successful uh, approaches. The, uh, the approach that we offer here for scalable uh, uh, method to deal with, the, with, with this challenge is to use the, um, the common uh, semantic language. You're not talking in kinematics when you're planning your steps ahead. Consider a human driver or a human instructor. You wouldn't get an, uh, a, uh, an instruction that says, please drive uh, five meters per second 
for three seconds, but you would, it would tell you something semantically meaningful, like move two lanes to the left and uh, position yourself behind that vehicle or position yourself uh, before that vehicle. And this is the kind of language we are adopting in order to make the uh, computational planning problem much more tractable. Okay? We're planning by this uh, well-conceptualized semantic language of, of uh, you don't need to do that on, on a milliseconds basis and on, uh, and on, uh, and on a meters per second basis. So, Let's look at the double lane merge. I think, let's look at, uh, at uh, we're, uh, we're starting to see some videos. <laughs> let's look at the um, uh, roundabouts as a, like one of the biggest, best inventions uh, to deal with intersections, which are very, uh, very weak points in terms of safety. And uh, there we're running into a, sec a second problem of double lane merge, meaning two vehicles. This, is, this exemplifies this problem without the geometry of a roundabout. Vehicles that are interest, interested to, uh, the red ones are interested to go to the right, the white ones are interested to go to the left, okay? Uh, and they have around 100 meters to negotiate that. And the driving policy solutions that we talked about, the semantic driving policy solutions that we talked about, along with the RSS, the Responsibility uh, Sensitive Safety Model, yields the following results of zero, round zero percent accident. And the round zero is very, very important here. It's just it's not a mathematically uh, sufficient proof of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the formal safety model, but it is at least a supportive evidence of it. We show that by 100,000 runs, we had no accidents solving this negotiation problem. And more importantly, it's, it won't tell you a lot, but it's running within one millisecond, one millisecond of computation. We're not, we're, we were able both to solve the safety issue as well as scale the computational problem. Um, this is the extension for occlusions. Uh, here you see vehicles. Uh, by the way, all of these were trained, as I said, uh, trained driving policy machines. What you see here is the vehicle making very intuitive uh, decision of either driving slow close to the occluding vehicle or driving faster farther away from the occluding vehicle. Let's look at it again. Please watch the white vehicle's uh, conduct. As they approach the red vehicles, they take some safety distance away so they can continue driving fast, so that they have enough time in terms of visibility time and blame that we talked about earlier to implement that. Uh. All right, here comes the, the, very, the quicker uh, view of how do we solve scalable sensing solution? What do we offer as a scalable sensing solution? Uh, Human drivers rely on their eyes alone. All of the information is in the visual field of view. Neither of us have radars, lidars. It's a biological fact of that sort. The, uh, we're not claiming that we are to solve an autonomous driving solution without redundancy and, and uh, additional sensors, but one must recall that the visual field of view is a comprehensive perception space. In what sense, in what sense is it comprehensive? It captures the full environment model elements. That would be the drivable area boundaries, that's the green carpet that you see, the driving path geometry, which is the geometry of, of road within that area, movable obstacles or road users, that would be the vehicles or pedestrians, and the rich family of semantics. Semantics could be explicit, like the content of a traffic sign or the color of traffic light, and could be very implicit, like this pedestrian is crossing the road while watching his cell phone. That's another, another semantic uh, cue that can be used while driving. Um, sorry. Uh, let's skip this one in just in sake of time. In order to, get to, to reach uh, environment perception uh, redundancy enhancement and comfort enhancement, we need to deal with redundant sources of information for all of these elements of the, drive, of the uh, environment model. That would be... Uh, Drivable area boundaries and driving path geometry, or let's, let's look mostly on road geometry and road semantics, such as the traffic sign content, may only be uh, served redundantly, or this information may only come from maps. There is no other sensor that can replace uh, visual sensing of these cues. Lane marks, markings on the road, or content of traffic signs. There are 
uh, uh, other technologies like communication from the road or from the signs, but we are talking about a self-sufficient agent running in the current environment. Uh, uh, road users and uh, some of the road boundaries which are structural, which are not just a uh, gravel, for example, there is something there, may be sensed by radar and LiDAR sensors. Um, we'll show just the uh, uh, approach of first about the mapping, talk about the mapping. What comes out of the need for the map to serve as the redundancy layer of road geometry is that the map has to faithfully represent reality at very low delay. Very faithfully represent reality at very low, meaning if outside of your house there is a new construction area, your autonomous vehicle will have to know about that construction area when you get there, okay? Um, so our approach, of course, to the problem, and, and right now it's a kind of a, kind of widespread approach to the problem, is crowdsourced mapping. Uh, Mobileye being a, a, a supplier for ADAS vehicles with cameras on board uh, is using this, uh, this asset, this fleet of vehicles, to harvest information which is useful for mapping the roads around us. This is a very scalable approach in the sense that we're using existing vehicles, existing technology, um, with, uh, with uh, no added costs to it, to allow this kind of harvesting of information. The harvesting of information, uh, if we just look again into it, it uh, includes landmarks in the environment and the geometry of the road as we go within it. Second element of the, uh, of the map is, of course, aggregating this information into a valid and very, very accurate map. That, uh, uh, it has to be accurate and it has to serve uh, any person who wants to localize itself within it, any agent. It has to serve uh, some um, uh, uh, sorry, landmarks or triangulation points content within it. Uh, so here we see a very complicated road network that, that we have mapped uh, with, our, with our partners in, a, in a Nissan, uh, Ijima's team actually, uh, working uh, on mapping the Japanese highways before the end of next year by this approach. So last one is, uh, the, the third step is once you have that map, how do you use it in autonomous driving? In this case, what we show is that the map is uh, the agent is localizing himself within the map based on these yellow landmarks that you see scattered around the image. And then we project the map to the image space. So what do you, what do you see here? The green line, the orange line, the yellow line is not real-time sensing of the road geometry, but rather projection of the map to the image to show that we don't really need the real-time sensing. That's the redundancy. That's exactly the redundancy that we proved by that. Okay, so last few slides, a couple of slides. First of all is how do we, how do we integrate, in light of this view of safety, how do we integrate uh, uh, map, camera, and other sensors? First, we point out that uh, since the camera is, contains all of the, uh, all of the uh, semantic information, all of the lanes and the drive, uh, uh, driving paths, along with the objects. They are co-localized in the same sensing space. Camera serves as sort of the uh, 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 association space. That's, this is where you're associating evidence from different sources. Because the camera has the full coordinated picture. A single image has a full coordinated picture of all elements. Now you want to associate other sources of evidence, if it's a map or if it's radars and lidars, into that, uh, that coordinated space. Uh, to make sure that you're aligned between the sensors and to make sure that you're time synchronized between the sensors. Uh, the map is a very good example to it. What you see here is a three-dimensional... Sorry, you're not seeing it. What you see here is a, on the right side is a three-dimensional environmental model created only by cameras. What's the trick here is that cameras that were traveling this road beforehand created three-dimensional map. This map was used in the fusion process, projected onto the image, and then taking, elevating the rest of the road users to three dimensions in a way that, is, that preserves the lane assignment, that preserves the very important semantics. We know which vehicle is in, within each lane uh, because we coordinated it in the image space. 
Uh, yes, no. <laughs> uh, last outcome of that, and that's the last slide I have. Last outcome of that uh, important, I'll, I'll just go to the green, uh, green uh, map that we had to summarize and see what is the last bit that I want to contribute here. So we talked about a formal model that uses the semantics of blame. What is, who is to blame and what is the, my blame, what is the other uh, agent's blame. Uh, we created this formal model and based on that formal model we derived uh, requirements or uh, a, a measure of whether a sensing error is a safety critical one or a comfort error. Then uh, we moved to talk about uh, how to approach scalably the decision-making problem, driving policy problem. And we, uh, we presented a driving policy that implements the scalability with the safety. Uh, and last, we discussed the uh, computer vision sensing, mapping and sensor fusion. Uh, the last contribution is around sensor fusion. I just want to go to that slide and conclude that given that we offer a um, compliance check of any system. You can check whether it is RSS compliant with a very simple and, and uh, implementable piece of code that we actually publish to the, to the industry. We are uh, we're getting a very good uh, merit out of it, which is not, not trivial. It really separates out the perception used for driving comfort, the perception and the way you perceive the environment, the way you decide to describe the environment for comfort purposes, from the way you decide to describe the environment for safety purposes. And this decoupling is very critical technologically. It means that you can make completely different decisions when it comes to the shorter term safety critical elements of your decisions from the longer term uh, comfortable driving uh, metrics. And that's, that's a completely different, uh, uh, completely different uh, 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 measures to the success of your technology. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>
I think it's good to remind ourselves that we are talking about the road transport system, a very open and complex system where we want people to actually live their lives, having the possibility for mobility, and, and that is an extremely positive thing. But it has downsides. The World Health Organization calculation of one and a quarter million fatalities per year, as you heard Klaus Tingvall say earlier today, we have killed around 100 million people in that system. So there's good reason to consider how can we change, how can we improve, how can we make things better. And I think the last 20 years, in parallel with UNCAP, it has been a growing acceptance for the zero target. The elimination of fatalities, the elimination of severe injuries. And it could easily be thought of as a trivial thing saying zero instead of 100,000 or diminishing. But from the strategy point of view, it is very, very different to say it's something we shall eliminate compared to something we will try to do slightly better. You will have to backcast in different ways. You'll have to attack the problem with a different mindset. And as Klaus said, taking the economical aspect away, which is slowly happening, is an eye-opener for many people working in the field of road traffic safety. But getting back to automation, I think it's important to look a bit at the bigger trends that we see in society today, and as everyone is aware, we are getting more and more digital. Just looking at the setup here on the scene, it is very different from when I started to give presentation on slides and, and very primitive tools. Digitalization is opening possibilities that we cannot really grasp because it's going so fast. We have the movement to shared economy. And uh, as middle-aged males, perhaps we don't fully understand that we should share our car with our neighbor. But when we look at younger generations, it's quite evident that having a car, being parked 95 to 98% of, the, car, of your, the time, is a fairly stupid thing, how to use resources. Shared economy is changing our way of living, and I think it's coming quite rapidly. We see a growth in population in the world, and together with that, much of the expansion will happen in urban areas. It is not in the countryside that we will have a lot more people. We will have to build hundreds of very, very big cities in the next 50 years. Someone said, let's forget about the design of the cities of today and just focus on getting the new cities to be right, which is an interesting thought. We have <coughs> an aging population, not only one year per year, but we actually live longer. We live uh, at a higher quality of life, and especially with very high expectations of mobility, also into very high ages. And we have, I would say, starting the last few years, a rapid electrification of the transport sector. The internal combustion engine is probably a bit of the past in the next 10 to 20 years. So we must think electricity in a way which we have not done in the past. And as an effect of all of those movements, the livable city is becoming more and more important. If you see mature cities around the globe, they all try to talk about the positive things they can deliver to people. They want to be greener, they want to be more comfortable, they want them to be more attractive to people. So livable cities is a very, very big movement. Uh, errors. We can always debate whether it should be 90 or 95 or even 100%. There's always an element of human error when things are going wrong out in the transport system. And I think a safe system or a vision zero system is very much about absorbing the errors and mistakes that people do. And probably it's also about absorbing the errors that automated cars can do. Because if we build that margin into the system, that can be used by humans, but it can also be used by the automated cars. And I would say this is, since 20 years, the paradigm for road traffic safety, absorbing errors and mistakes not trying to build the perfect human being. 
model vehicle safety has developed tremendously. Um, 20 years of URNCAP is a nice example. If we look at the cars that hit the market 20 years ago, that was the first generation of airbag cars. And with the airbags came the demand for a more stable structure. That is now everyday practice. And when I make calculations in Sweden about the improvements in road safety, about two-thirds of the annual improvement could be attributed to the exchange of vehicles. We exchange five, six percent of the vehicles every year. But anyhow, two-thirds of the improvements we see come from better vehicles. And we have seen automated functions that are virtually eliminating some crash types. ESC is virtually taking all loss of control out of the system, also in Sweden with snow and ice and everything, virtually eliminated. We see how AEB is actually taking vast majority of low-speed rear-end crashes away. We see how lane departure warning has already shown a 50% reduction in the warning mode. Enhancing that with um, support could give even more. And we have other technical systems in the cars, like seatbelt reminders, the good support for not speeding, uh, driver alertness, etc. And together with these developments, we see how cars have developed a primitive sense of awareness for the situation. And we heard a very nice presentation about how Mobile Eye is looking at situational awareness. What are the sensors? What are the approaches to that? So it doesn't come as a surprise that many people are looking at automating, putting all those functions together and automating the system. But from the safety perspective, we must also understand that with the developments, with the knowledge we have, we will not have a lot of in-car fatalities in the future. I would say if I would manufacture cars or in any way control and guide vehicle industry, I would say look a lot more of the people around the vehicle, perhaps more than the people inside the vehicle. Don't forget about them, but that's very much to do outside. So what do I believe is characteristics of an automated car? Well, first of all, I think safety will be a given and it will be the limiting factor. Because it's something very strange happening when I go from being a driver to being the passenger. And we see that in the willingness to pay for safe aviation. We see it in the willingness to pay for safe trains, which is a lot higher compared to the willingness to pay as a driver. So expect a lot higher safety demands when you cannot blame the driver anymore. It will be a new situation. So it will be also a situation where perceived safety is a lot more important than before. Because if, as Ola has been talking about, trust isn't there, you will not use the function. So you must perceive the car as being safe. And I think also that the full crash avoidance will be a lot more important in the automated car compared to the manually driven car. But over and beyond everything, avoiding severe injuries and fatalities will be there. And it will be a very tricky discussion about how much of crashes, how much of reduced comfort am I prepared to offer. So these cars will be careful, they will be polite, they will be law-abiding, which is extremely good for road traffic safety, and they have to be social. They have to talk to the people around them. Situational awareness for them should also support situational awareness for other car users, pedestrians, bicyclists, so we understand the intention of each other. And I just want to draw your attention to the Vienna Convention. People often cite the Vienna Convention, but a different paragraph than this one, but I'll read it out. Road users shall avoid any behavior likely to endanger or obstruct traffic, to endanger persons or to cause damage to public or private property. That is, of course, also extremely valid when there is a computer driving. 
exactly the same care will be needed. And we know that if we are uncertain, low speeds or separation is a way forward. A car driving in five kilometers an hour can probably stop in 15 centimeters. The situational awareness can be very limited, still safe. Or you will have, as illustrated here, you will have to have very good sensors, knowing things far away, because in the end of the day, you should be able to stop for anything obstructing or endangering your journey. So for me, with a coordinate saying the car must be safe, it must have a perception, and it must be able to stop, the challenge will be efficiency and not safety. So probably we will see the first automated methods being at very low speed or in fairly trivial traffic situations where you can fulfill this. But trying to move this a bit further onto mobility, there are some, I would say, almost philosophical questions. Should we make the system as of today automated? Or should we look at a completely different road transport system? Very much of what we heard so far today is about more or less substituting the driver of today with a computer, not elaborating so much on what could be the new possibilities. And again, my personal view is substituting a middle-aged male in his car on his way to the job with a computer so he can drive, drive and or drive, be in the car reading the newspaper. That is not a big thing for mankind. Could be on the individual level interesting. And having cars parked 96, 95, 98 percent of the time is not a very clever thing. So this is just an example how one megacity has decided on their mobility plan. And the interesting thing is on the far right. It is Mexico City. It is 23 million daily trips. It's about to Sweden in size, around 10 million people. But they have decided to put walking on top of the pyramid. That is priority number one. People should be able to walk in their city. Priority two is people should be able to bike in their city. Three, public transport. Four, logistics, getting goods in and out. And on their priority scale, private cars, private motorcycles are in the basement. Imagine this being the design paradigm for our cities in the 40s, in the 50s, when we designed everything for cars, when we actually pushed our kids out of the streets to give us middle-aged males priority in, in the traffic. This is extremely radical, and it is coming from a very important town. And I would say they are not unique. I think this is very much the future in many of the megacities. So for me, at least, mobility will be the future. It's not driving your own car. I think these low-speed pod cars, which is not the future, it's already here. It's running on commercial basis in some of the cities. That will be a big thing. How to get goods out to people, either in those micro starship things or in the Google patent where you more or less have a container you put out automatically where you can collect your goods. How automated modes, walking and biking, is getting a good marriage with public transport will also be extremely important. The multimodality, not being in my box all the way, but accepting that I can be in different boxes. But we must also understand not everything is the same. The needs in the rural areas, the needs in the bigger cities, they are very, very different. So I don't think we will flip a switch and go from being manual to automated overnight. So that's an important thing to understand. So for me, the digitalization is the fundamental factor to start to get mobility as a service. Telling the computer word, where am I, where do I want to go in the most efficient way. The shared economy, we will see car sharing on completely different new ways. And where a shared car, of course, can go home to my parking lot, 
or to my door standing there when I need it. It's not used by me all the time, so it's hovering around, getting to me. And also how the car sharing is marrying with public transport. So for me, loving cars, public transport is a very interesting sector in the future. How could you make that automated, attractive, and efficient for everyone? I think for aging population, also the automated functions could become extremely important. How can all the sensors, all the situation awareness, all the actuators support me in the future, my mother today, not to reverse into things, not to lose situational awareness, having the emergency braking, everything like that. Because we will demand high quality mobility also when we are getting older. I think the electrification is going extremely well hand in hand with automated cars. I can have a car which has the right amount of energy for my journey. I can have a car which is going away, refueling the electricity and getting back to me. So the car, small cars, the pods and the logistics will be electrified in the near future. And definitely I think from this we will have a more livable life in our cities but also in our countryside. So thank you for my moment on the scene. Hmm? Well, thank you, Anders. Um, when I started opening up this session this afternoon, I think we talked about automated driving being such a big, big topic. And even if you restrict it to the safety dimension, I think it still would allow us to talk a few days more about <laughs> the topic. So what we have to really try to do this afternoon is, is to create a, a kind of a matrix for you, looking both at the societal side of things, which Anders has did, to the individual interpretation of what automated driving means for, for the consumer. Uh, the technology on one side, uh, regulations on the other side. So it all has to come together one day or another. Mm. Uh, and that's the space where we are in at the moment. So I hope that you enjoyed uh, this kind of multi-faceted approach to, to the topic at this moment. Uh, we have some time still for, for questions. We're supposed to finish at four. It's quarter to four now. Um, I think only Reimer has, Brian has left, I think, but all the other uh, panelists are still here. Uh, so I think they are certainly willing to uh, answer any questions that you may have. On the other hand, I can promise that uh, most of the slides uh, can be shared with you, uh, uh, as, as long as I can permission to share them, of course. And we will do that, we'll contact you via email with a link uh, so you can download and, uh, and see them again. Are there any urgent questions to the people that have presented the material? I know there's a lot, lot to digest. I'm Sern, I'm from Denmark. Yeah. I, I have a general uh, question. Does it in the future make sense to do a crash test of a car which can't actually crash? How, how will Euroincap deal with this uh, for the future, that the car will not be able to crash? Does it meet? It make any sense to, to do crash test for the future? Hola, you want to give it a try? <laughs> <laughs> As a restrained developer. So, uh, yeah, but obviously, I'm, 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 I mean, we're going to have a mixed traffic for, for so many years. So, so yes, a car, there will be cars that cannot crash, but they will be crashed into. So, yes, there's a need to rate and to design a car from being crashed into, which is a load case maybe you didn't think of. Or was, it, was that answering my, the question? Yes, but you change the way to test the car. Okay, yeah. that's well, I, I think certainly in our roadmap that we just published today, uh, that you will see a section where we discuss this, this in particular. So uh, we come from an area of passenger safety. We have, from 2009, really stimulated avoidant type of systems to come into the rating. Uh, I think what we see now is the next phase would be merging these two together. And that kind of opens up the question that you just posed is how are you going to assess 
systems, uh, passive safety systems that actually are deployed or not deployed based on the circumstances, based on what sensors see around the vehicle. And that will probably have to be uh, dealt with, and that's what we want to do, want to deal with uh, going forward, where we actually allow the manufacturer to actually uh, use sensor information in the crash test to optimize. Uh, from a worst case perspective, uh, however, we always have to assume that there may be situations where the sensors are not perfect. And there may be uh, bad weather conditions or other sorts of problems with sensors that actually would mean that the car doesn't have any information and needs to rely on deployment of, of its passenger safety systems. So for us, uh, these are two fundamental things that we want to keep in the rating system. The, the worst case scenario, the protective of the consumer at the end of the day where nothing is there anymore. And how do we encourage the further integration of passive and active safety systems in, 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 in more efficient safety solutions for consumers. I, I think the, the photo from Japan with a uh, car flying over the median divider is an example of situations where the passive safety will have a very important role also in the future. But of course we need, in the longer term, to learn from the efficiency and the reliability of the active safety systems. And when we see that they are reliable all over, of course we can have a renewed discussion about what could happen with the road design, what can happen with the vehicle design. Anybody else has a question? Yes, sorry, can't see you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Payne from Australia. Ah, Michael. Uh, <laughs> the, um, um, I'm very interested in the mobile eye development of basically knowing what the characteristics of the road ahead because one of my concerns about, uh, say, steering crash avoidance is what are you steering into? And it seems to me you, 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 you're knowing more about the characteristics up ahead than just uh, what the cameras see. Eris, do you have a question? Answer? It's, it's your long distance awareness. How much more than the camera can see will you use in your algorithms, in, in your decision making? If, if you come up here, you get the microphone on. And Thank you. <laughs> okay, so thanks for the question. I think. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for the question. I think that uh, part of the uh, disambiguation of the importance of sensing for safety aspects versus the importance, not the importance, but what implications the sensing system may have on safety critical uh, aspects versus what implications the sensing system may have on driving comfort. And I think this disambiguation answers or addresses your question. In most cases, the very far range uh, uh, is linked to drive comfort and drive longer term planning. Whereas uh, when you come to deal with safety critical decisions by that uh, safety model that we presented, you're usually looking, even in highway speeds, at much shorter distances. So uh, you have in these areas also comfortably, uh, without over specifying very fancy other sensors looking at, uh, with, with camera, the, the cameras have the uh, advantages of scaling gracefully with resolution. You can reach far distances if you have the right optics. Uh, they have other limitations, visibility conditions, they don't have depth perception directly, but uh, this, this disambiguation relaxes the specification of far range sensing needs, right. formally. Thanks, Jim. Cheers. One more question? Yes. Hello, uh, I'm Ingrid Skogsmo. I'm uh, at this time working at the European Commission on the research side. Uh, we talk a lot to uh, today about automated vehicles here. Uh, sometimes in the debate you hear about connected, cooperative, automated vehicles. So uh, I was just wondering, do you have any thoughts on how connectivity or cooperative uh, driving could uh, enhance uh, getting forwards to Vision Zero or in your NCAP's future? Sure. So if, if you would uh, have a look at our roadmap, uh, there is a section on V2X technology and how we see it uh, becoming important. 
um, from our discussions with uh, many OEMs um, that we had in the preparation of our strategic roadmap, uh, we found out that I think this is on everybody's radar. However, um, there are still some big hurdles to make as far as uh, standardization in the marketplace before we can really expect this to be adding value uh, in the safety equation. Uh, so yes, we believe that uh, this, of course, will be the next revolution where we can actually extend our visibility, as we have seen from uh, Mobileye's presentation, much further than what the current sensors can do. Uh, specifically for the more vulnerable road users, like power two-wheelers, uh, this will be an ultimate solution, I think. Uh, the time frame that we have currently put it is more like 2024. Uh, just because of what we believe still needs to be agreed on in Europe, in Europe between the European member states in terms of standardization of communication uh, between vehicles. Anders, you want to say a few things? Oh, just adding perhaps that communication is already today essential for many strategic decisions in the driving and, and perhaps coming into the tac tactical ones. But when you get to operations, when you go to things which is here very close, I don't think it will happen in the next two years that communication is the key. But as Michelle is saying, as technology is developing, standards are developing, and, and the market is slowly penetrated by those systems, the, the capabilities and the possibilities will increase significantly. Thanks for your question. Jacques Wismans, uh, SafeTech and Chalmers University. I hope you can see me. Yep. Um, we, we heard today the figures of 1.3, 1.4 million fatalities per year. 80% um, of these fatalities are in developing countries. And of these 80%, uh, 60 to 80% are uh, vulnerable road users. So the cyclists, pedestrians, and a lot of motorcyclists as well. And with Trends like e-bikes, uh, higher speeds on the, on, 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 uh, for bicycles and so on. So my question to the panel is how you think that automation can help reducing these type of uh, fatalities. Um, since particularly also many of these are not impacts with, with, uh, with, with cars. Ola, remember you had an Indian data source. I guess you did that for a reason. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Partly answering the question. So, so the calculations I showed was basically uh, major impacts actually on, on this type of accidents because a larger part is caused by vehicles uh, colliding with, with, with uh, two-wheelers and, and, uh, and pedestrians. So, so, so indeed we do see this, this uh, dramatic decrease of fatalities of putting this technology in, into the cars. But you are addressing maybe that people will change their behavior during these years and, and, uh, and going by uh, e-bikes, for example. And then the question is maybe how can we use the same technologies in, in, in two-wheelers? And I'm not the person to answer that, but I guess at least it's a good start to have a battery in, in the vehicle, yeah. in the, in the two-wheeler. I think we must remember that to some degree the cars, the buses, the tracks can address the power two-wheelers. But on the other hand, it's getting more and more absurd that we allow unprotected road users at speeds up to 70, 80 kilometers an hour when we have safety in focus. And that is why I'm a keen e-biker uh, because the e-bike has a speed which is more relevant for our biomechanical levels. 30 kilometers an hour on its own is not that dangerous. And then the real risks are coming together with the interaction with other uh, road users. And, and the second thing is really the economy of scale is of course making it possible in the future to transfer a lot of the knowledge, a lot of the technologies which are way too expensive today to put on an e-bike or, or on a simple motorcycle. It is doable to put them also on those modes of transport in the future. All right. Okay, then I think it's time to wrap up uh, this afternoon and also the day for your NCAP. Uh, thanks everyone for, for coming. It's really appreciated from our side that, you, that you're here and willing to celebrate with us. Um, 
I want to thank, obviously, the speakers for coming um, and refer you to tomorrow when the Jacobi conference starts at Elsenveld, which is about 15 minutes from here walking. Uh, so we look forward to three more days of uh, intense research discussions, uh, specifically on, on biomechanics and, and what automated vehicles will do in the future uh, and, and change circumstances inside the vehicle, but also, of course, uh, on vulnerable road users and other uh, means of transport. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, also, Michiel. Thank uh, you Anders for, for helping me. And, uh, well, have a good evening and a good way back. Thank you. Good evening.